Hello, everyone. My name is Michel. Thank you very much for joining us today. So we are all aware of the important role that stress plays in our condition. Many of us have noticed that our symptoms worsen during stress. Some of us also experience stress-related symptoms such as anxiety and depression. So we are therefore privileged to be able to listen to, to, to Dr. Rick Helmick, who will be talking to us today about stress and Parkinson's. Rick works as a neurologist and associate professor specializing in Parkinson's and trauma disorders at the Radboud University Medical Center with Professor Bas Bloom and at the, the, the Donders Institute in the Netherlands. Before we start, I would like to remind everyone that this session is for information and education purposes only. So if you're seeking medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, you should really consult a medical professional. There will be time for Q&A for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You can enter the questions anytime you want from now, actually. For those of you who don't know us yet, No Silver Bullet is a Parkinson support group managed by Mark Lambert and myself. We, we aim to help you and, frankly, to motivate you to become well-informed generalists in your condition and to make informed choices on how to adapt your lifestyle to slow down disease progression. To that end, we are organizing Zoom sessions like today's with researchers and PD specialists to update you on the latest advances in science and medicine, nutrition, exercise, and wellness. We post the recordings of our sessions on YouTube and, to, and on Spotify, and we also recently started posting short videos on TikTok and Instagram. I invite you to subscribe to those channels so that you're informed when we post new content. The details of the, those channels and how to access them are in the chat section at the bottom of your screen. But let's come back to today's topic and to Rick, who will be talking to us about managing stress and Parkinson's. Rick, the stage is yours. Thank you very well. Uh, thank you very much, Michelle and Mark. Uh, it's really a true pleasure to be here uh, and to speak um, uh, to you. Um, I will start by sharing my screen. Here we go. I hope you can all see it. Yes, perfect. Um, <clears throat> Yes, so my name is Rick Helmig. Um, I'm a neurologist specializing in movement disorders and also a researcher specializing in the pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease um, at the Donners Institute in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. And um, today I would like to take you through this menu and discuss with you um, what is stress um, and how important is stress to Parkinson's disease. And there are, are a few topics that I would like to focus on. Um, and this is also because many people living with Parkinson's disease ask me about these topics. And one of the topics is, can stress cause Parkinson's disease? Another is, how does stress influence the symptoms of Parkinson's disease? And uh, four, <clears throat> what can we do about it? So, Probably you will all be aware that um, one of the core mechanisms underlying Parkinson's disease is a loss of dopamine cells um, uh, in the brain, uh, as you can see here. Um, and the result of that is a loss of dopamine in the basal ganglia, as you can see here. So on the left is a healthy person. And then uh, on the in middle and right are uh, the scans of people with Parkinson's disease. Um, and this leads to a number of symptoms. And the most, uh, well, recognizable symptoms are probably stiffness, slowness, and tremor. Um, but many patients also have non-motor symptoms, such as constipation, um, anxiety, and depression. And it is these last symptoms that I mentioned, anxiety and depression, that are related to chronic stress, that are stress-related symptoms. So stress is, um, well, a major issue in our society, and it is not a new issue. So when I searched for um, covers on, in Time magazine on stress, um, the first uh, one that I discovered on the left was already in 1983. So it is a continuing topic in our society. So what is stress? Um, let me just start by showing you a video. So what you've seen here is um, <clears throat> a very 
um, well, is the, the benefit of stress. So this is uh, the acute effects of stress that allows this animal to immediately get into motion and jump away from the crocodile. And the way that this works is that during acute stress, there is a very rapid release of noradrenaline in the brain um, that you can see on the right side. And this noradrenaline is released in um, a whole set of brain regions, which allows the brain to become active at once. At the same time, um, stress also leads to a release of stress hormones in the blood um, that can have a much longer uh, acting and, and slower um, effects. Um, and these two effects are very different, the long-term and the short-term effects, uh, and they both are relevant for uh, people living with Parkinson's disease. So the effects of stress on the brain are illustrated by this study showing in healthy people what a very stressful movie does to brain activity. Uh, and this, uh, these are data from an fMRI scanner um, where healthy people watched a neutral movie or a very stressful movie. And what you can see is that during that stressful movie, um, the whole brain basically lights up as compared to the neutral movie. Um, stress also has an effect on the dopamine system. And that is where it um, also becomes relevant for Parkinson's disease. So these pictures I showed you before, and uh, the dopamine binding in the brain of a healthy person and the reduced dopamine binding in someone uh, with Parkinson's disease. And what happens during a acute stressful situation is that there is a uh, release of dopamine in the basal ganglia. And um, we think that this release of dopamine during stressful situations helps people to immediately come into motion, for example, when you have to run away from a threatening situation. However, if there is very little dopamine left in the brain, then this um, release of dopamine squeezes out the last bits of dopamine uh, that are left, um, and that could lead to symptoms. Another effect of stress um, <clears throat> is when it becomes chronic stress, so when stress um, remains. And this is, for example, in situations where um, you have conflicts at work or conflicts with your partner or financial worries or well, some other things that happen for a, a long time. Um, and this chronic stress can also have effects on the brain. So that is the picture here shown on the right, that during chronic stress, certain brain areas can um, grow, um, such as, uh, for example, the amygdala, and other brain regions can start to shrink a little bit, for example, the hippocampus. And the amygdala is a brain region that is very important for anxiety, for stress feelings. And the hippocampus is a brain region that is important for memory. So that might explain why chronic stress also can lead to um, complaints, for example, in terms of uh, memory loss. <clears throat> there are also other, well, detrimental effects of chronic stress on the brain. Not only does it affect the uh, structure and the function of certain brain regions, but it also has an effect on um, uh, things like inflammation uh, in the blood. And these different processes might all contribute to, um, well, uh, a, a worsening of symptoms in people with Parkinson's disease. So I, I already mentioned that. Um, um, uh, anxiety and depression often occur in people with Parkinson's disease. And uh, in the literature, there are about, well, the numbers vary a little bit, but about one third of patients uh, suffer from depression and about, well, 
10 to 25 percent uh, of people with Parkinson's disease suffer from anxiety feelings. So these symptoms are very common. Stress is also a priority for people. So in this study, we asked people um, with Parkinson's disease what their top list of um, uh, symptoms was for which they would like to have some more attention from their caregivers. And we also asked the professionals um, treating people with Parkinson's disease what their top priorities were. And then we looked at the differences and so um, at the, the, the top of this graph, um, you see the symptoms that are more mentioned by patients than by professionals. And on the, on the bottom of this graph, you see symptoms that are mentioned more by professionals than by patients. And at the top of that list is stress. So that means that uh, people with Parkinson's disease indicated that they would like to have some more attention for, uh, for, for that symptom, which is not often recognized by uh, professionals. So one of the um, stories that I hear a lot from people that I treat with Parkinson's disease and also questions that I get a lot from people is if stress causes Parkinson's disease. And the reason why people ask that is that um, many people experienced that the first symptoms of Parkinson's disease actually started shortly after a very stressful um, event. And that could be, for example, a surgery, or it could be uh, losing someone that you love, or it could be a, a traffic accident or, well, something very stressful. And this is um, a letter that I received from um, a lady with Parkinson's disease who wrote me, the reason I wanted your opinion in the first instance was to be able to discuss the possibility that I may have a psychogenic form of Parkinson's disease. Why I think this is because on the day following a very traumatic experience, when my husband had a heart attack while abroad, the tremor began. And so this lady, thought that she might have a psychological form of Parkinson's disease because um, her complaint started so immediately after a stressful event, while in fact she had the normal Parkinson's disease. And I think that this, um, also in this case, it is not, it is not um, to be understood that the, the, the traumatic experience really caused the Parkinson's disease. But I think what actually happened is that the traumatic experience, the stressful experience, unmasked a Parkinson's disease that was already lingering in the background. And this is um, also very recently what we've seen in some people um, who presented to, uh, to us with Parkinson's disease symptoms immediately after a COVID infection, which um, made them very ill. And also here, we think that it is really the unmasking of uh, Parkinson's disease that is already present by, in this case, um, a stressful disease, or in the previous case, a stressful event uh, with her husband. And the reason why I think that stress does not cause Parkinson's disease, but can unmask it, is that several studies have shown that, the, that Parkinson's disease already starts many, many years before people experience their first symptoms. So, for example, in this study in the Netherlands, the Rotterdam study, people, healthy people were followed for many, many, many decades um, and seen every year. And some of these people developed Parkinson's disease after many years. And then the researchers looked back at the years just before the, they developed Parkinson's disease, if something was already there that could be measured. So in, in, uh, on the left, you see uh, the vertical line indicates uh, at zero the, when the diagnosis was made. But when the researchers looked back at um, 
well, some signs of slowness. They found that already seven years before the diagnosis was made, there was some very mild slowness that could be observed in these um, people. And the same with tremor. Um, already four years before uh, the symptoms, before the diagnosis was made, there was some trembling that was already seen by the investigators, but it was not enough at that time for the diagnosis of Parkinson's. And of course, these motor functions are not the only fun uh, symptoms that can happen before the diagnosis. Um, things like the inability to smell or uh, living out your dreams um, uh, during sleeping or constipation are also very early signs that can happen up to 20 years before the diagnosis is made. And that indicates that when a very stressful event happens and um, immediately afterwards people have symptoms of Parkinson's disease, it is not very likely that the disease started immediately. It is more likely that the disease was already there, um, but that this stressful event um, unmasked the, the disorder. <clears throat> So another relevant question is, um, does stress affect the course of Parkinson's disease? So we all know that Parkinson's disease is a progressive disease. Um, it worsens over the years. In some people, it worsens a bit faster. In other people, it worsens uh, slower. Um, and does stress affect how fast Parkinson's disease develops? So in humans, there are no data about that at all. Um, <clears throat> in animal studies, there are some uh, interesting data showing that in mice who received a neurotoxin that makes, um, that, that uh, initiates Parkinson's disease in these mice, if these mice were stressed, um, the loss of dopamine cells is what you see here in this picture. So the, all the, the, the brown cells, the brown color means dopamine cells. And when these mice were stressed, so that is the picture on the right, there were fewer dopamine cells that survived than when these mice um, were not stressed, which is the picture on the left. Another study <clears throat> Um, also in mice, so not in, in, in not in humans, but in mice, injected cortisol, which is a stress hormone, into um, uh, into the blood of these mice, and they measured uh, alpha synuclein um, in those brain regions that I showed here. And what they showed is that when these mice were injected with uh, cortisol, there was more alpha synuclein in the brain than in mice who were not injected with cortisol. And alpha-synuclein, as you might know, is um, this abnormally folded protein that um, uh, builds up in the brain of people with Parkinson's disease and that damages these nerve cells. So this again shows that injection of stress hormone in animals might um, have a negative effect on the brain structure. So um, this brought us to um, develop a idea that chronic stress um, might on the one hand lead to a worsening of uh, the disease. And on the other hand, people with Parkinson's disease are um, a bit more sensitive to stress. So what can we do th uh, about that? Um, before I address that question, I first want to um, discuss with you something that many people with Parkinson's disease experience in their daily life. And that is that stress can increase their symptoms. And one of the symptoms that is um, for which that is very clear is tremor. 
and this is a um, example. This is a um, gentleman living with Parkinson's disease and uh, addressed. He has a tremor of his right foot and of his right hand. And when I ask him to make very difficult um, uh, uh, mental arithmetic, you see that the tremor increases a lot. And um, this is not unique to Parkinson's disease. So this is, for example, a um, little boy who is perfectly healthy, who is terrified of water um, and is asked to jump in the water. And you see that he is uh, shaking all over um, when he tries to jump in the water. So what this shows is that the effects of stress on the motor symptom, uh, on, on the motor system, are also there in healthy people, um, but that people living with Parkinson's disease have, um, well, experienced this much more because they have a motor system that doesn't work very properly. So, um, I'm quite disconnected at the moment. On the other hand, we also know that uh, stress reduction can have a positive effect on motor symptoms. So this is Tom Isaacs, uh, the founder of Cure Parkinson's uh, uh, disease, who uh, shows that when he is meditating, his dyskinesias become uh, much less. Um, I'll just play this video for you. <clears throat> You might think that the video has stopped, but he is still meditating. <clears throat> and um, the dyskinesias are almost gone. So one of the questions we asked in our research is, why is it that Parkinson's tremor and also other symptoms increase during stress? Um, so to investigate this, we measured uh, 33 people with Parkinson's disease in the scanner and ask them to either lie still at rest or do uh, mental arithmetic. And we measured tremor with um, electrodes on their arm. We measured brain activity with uh, functional MRI and we measured the pupil diameter with eye tracking. And what we found is that uh, across the group as people probably already know, uh, tremor increased during those, well, cognitive co-activation, the stressful periods, the gray lines, as compared to the um, uh, rest periods, which are indicated in white. Um, what we also found is that heart rate increased during these stressful periods, and that pupil diameter increased during these stressful periods. Um, and that is interesting because the pupil diameter is an indicator of uh, activity in the noradrenergic uh, system. So this was already mentioned by uh, Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize. And he said, face a mirror, look at your eyes and invent a mathematical problem such as 81 times 17. Try to solve the problem and watch your pupil at the same time. After a few attempts, almost everyone is able to observe the pupillary dilation, so the pupil increasing, that accompanies mental effort. <clears throat> and it is well uh, also shown in, in animal studies that uh, indeed firing of neurons, of nerve cells in the locus ceruleus, so the area of the brain, that uh, releases noradrenaline and that the, the firing goes up 
when the pupil becomes wider and goes down when the pupil is, um, uh, is more narrow. So in other words, the fact that the tremor went up in, uh, in our study uh, in, in concert with the pupil getting wider means that the noradrenaline system probably plays a role in um, increasing the tremor in uh, Parkinson's disease. So when we looked at brain activity, we found that, um, well, there was tremor-related brain activity in these regions, so the motor cortex, the thalamus, and the cerebellum. And there was stress-related activity in these brain regions, so the red brain regions, uh, which process uh, stressful events. Um, and um, we also found that um, the way that stress really increases the tremor is probably by acting on the thalamus, which is this little small area deep inside the brain. Um, and we think that um, stress in that way can increase motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease by acting on the brain areas that produce these symptoms. So what is the effect of an external stressor on Parkinson's disease? And this has been a very interesting topic um, where many people have been interested in over the last few years, because we all had a, a very clear external stressor, um, which is COVID. And um, especially in the early years of COVID, um, COVID led to a lot of stress in healthy people, but particularly also in people living with chronic diseases like Parkinson's disease. So the WHO said, mentioned on their website, fear, worry, and stress are normal responses to perceived or real threats and at times when we are faced with uncertainty or the unknown. So it is normal and understandable that people are experiencing fear in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So at that time, we had a very large study going on in the Netherlands, which is still going on, in um, more than 500 people with Parkinson's disease who were measured at multiple time points. And in, these, in this group of people, we also investigated what the effects of the COVID pandemic were. And um, this is the timeline of the study. So uh, in the Netherlands, uh, the COVID pandemic um, well really started in March 2020. And uh, in this study, uh, we were able to start very rapidly. So um, about one month later um, uh, in April. And what we asked um, about 350 people with Parkinson's disease is to what extent their symptoms had changed during the COVID pandemic as compared to the period before. And um, responses more to the left mean that the symptoms got worse and responses more to the right mean that symptoms got better. Um, and in the middle, so around five, it means that there was nothing that changed. And the majority of people actually mentioned that there was no change of symptoms. But as you can see, um, about, well, 30 to 40% of uh, people indicated that their symptoms got worse during the COVID pandemic. And only a few percent indicated that their symptoms actually got better during the COVID pandemic. We also looked at stress during the pandemic and how that influenced um, the symptoms. Um, I'll, I'll skip over this slide. And what we measured during the in this study was what kind of stressors people with Parkinson's disease encountered uh, and how burdensome these uh, stressors were. And the most frequent stressors were loss of social contact, um, the media coverage, uh, the inability to perform physical activity or uh, hobbies as usual, and feeling restricted to leave home. And the most burdensome stressors were not being able to attend the funeral of a loved one or being restricted in visiting loved ones in the hospital. 
and we then tested whether the uh, uh, whether the stress that people experienced actually correlated with more Parkinson's symptoms and with more stress. And that was actually the case, as you can see on this graph on the right. So people who had more stress during the COVID pandemic, which is uh, well higher up on the, on the, on the y-axis, on the vertical axis, um, also had more symptoms, more motor symptoms, such as tremor or stiffness or slowness, which is um, indicated by more um, symptoms on the x-axis, so the horizontal line. And well, next we asked what what are the predictors of 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 these effects. So if we know who gets stressed during the uh, a pandemic, perhaps we can use that knowledge to help and protect people in the future when similar things happen. And what we found is that it is not really not the the, the disease severity of, of Parkinson's disease per se. It is not how long people have had, had had the disease or whether they are were men or women. Um, that didn't matter. But um, uh, um, psychological complaints such as anxiety or depression before the pandemic um predicted more stress during the pandemic and also um personality traits such as um well, optimism predicted the uh amount of stress that people experienced during the pandemic so based on that study we concluded that the covid pandemic has acted as an external stressor in parkinson's disease which leads to increased feelings of distress in patients, which in turn increase the severity of motor symptoms such as tremor, but also stiffness and slowness. And also that um, patients with, well, who already had some neuropsychiatric non-motor complaints, such as uh, some anxiety or depression before the whole pandemic started, were especially vulnerable. So the final part of my uh, presentation is if and how we can reduce stress in Parkinson's disease. So how can we manage this? And um, for that, we started by doing a very large online survey in 5,000 people with Parkinson's disease uh, in the United States. And we asked them about stress and how they coped with, with stress. And um, <clears throat> we had both people with Parkinson's disease and healthy controls. And when we compared the degree of stress um, that people with Parkinson's disease had, um, they were higher than people with controls. Um, they also had more feelings of, of panic um, than healthy people. Um, and they were less, well, mindful in, in daily life than uh, healthy people. So that confirms what we already know or thought, which is that people with Parkinson's disease um, experience more feelings of stress than healthy people. We also asked these um, 5,000 people if their symptoms got worse during stress or if they got better. And also here on the left side, it means that their symptoms worsen a lot. And on the right, it means that the symptoms improve a lot. And um, as you can see, tremor is on the top of the list again. So people uh, experienced that tremor uh, significantly got worse uh, during stress. And that is also when I show the same results like this. So, um, uh, the higher the blue bars, the more people uh, mention that uh, tremor got worse, which are the, the blue bars on the left. Um, and on the right, some people also mentioned that during stress, tremor actually got a little bit better, which are the, the very small blue bars here on the right. We also asked um, if 
what other things influence their symptoms? So what types of stress influenced uh, their symptoms? And um, as you can see here, things like conflicts and time pressure, social stress, people looking at you while, while you're eating in a restaurant or worrying were the, the most important factors that people indicated that worsened their symptoms. And on the other hand, um, what was also very interesting is that people also responded that when they enjoyed something, that when they were doing something that they truly enjoyed, that their symptoms actually got a lot better. Um, <clears throat> We also saw again that um, um, the degree of stress, which is on the on the y-axis, um, was very much related to the quality of life. So people with more stress had less quality of life. Um, we also saw that stress was correlated with rumination, so worrying. Um, people who had more stress were worrying more, had more worries. Um, and people with, um, who experienced more stress had lower self-compassion. Um, so self, well, being mild to yourself. Um, and people who had more stress had less, well, what we call dispositional mindfulness. So the ability to live in the moment. We also asked about what strategies people used to um, to, uh, to reduce their stress. And one of them that we asked about was mindfulness. And we asked how, well, would you, would you like to acquire mindfulness skills? And about 61% um, um, uh, of the people have never used mindfulness, but were very interested in, um, in learning about this. The, uh, about 39% of the patients of the 5,000 patients already used some form of mindfulness and the vast majority um, mentioned that they would rec recommend it to other patients as well. So we asked uh, in, that, in that same group of 5,000 people um, what the effect of mindfulness was on their motor symptoms. And um, uh, people responded that especially anxiety and depression, but also again, tremor improved during or after mindfulness uh, exercises. Uh, and this graph shows that people who mentioned that they use mindfulness several times a day, so the people on the right side of the curve experienced more effect of mindfulness uh, on their symptoms than people who performed it well only once a month. So the people on the left side of the curve. Of course, we don't know what is the cause and the consequence. So people who experience a lot of effect might be more inclined to do more mindfulness than people who experience no effect. So that, of course, we, we cannot say. Um, <clears throat> These findings uh, on our questionnaires um, also fit with a um, large study that was done in Hong Kong, uh, in China, where they investigated the effect of mindfulness yoga uh, versus stretching uh, on anxiety and depression in people with Parkinson's disease. And they found that mindfulness yoga uh, reduced depression and anxiety as compared to simple muscle stretching. Of course, mindfulness is not the only solution. Um, uh, so we also asked people about other stress reducing strategies that they used and that they thought were effective. And um, there were many other approaches that people had. Um, for example, uh, physiotherapy and physical exercise uh, were experienced as very effective in reducing feelings of distress, but also simple relaxation exercises, such as breathing exercises um, or other types of meditation. So my, <clears throat> and I'm here I'm almost at the end, 
my uh, conclusion is that um, stress reducing interventions such as mindfulness but also other interventions such as exercise uh, or relaxation exercises can improve motor and also non-motor symptoms in people with Parkinson's disease. My mission for the next years is try to unravel even more what are the mechanisms that um, underlie this effect of chronic stress on Parkinson's disease. So if it is really the case also in human people with Parkinson's disease, that chronic stress leads to a worsening uh, or an acceleration of the disease. Um, and what are the mechanisms that, um, that are underlying this effect? Um, I would like to thank you very much for your attention um, and Mark and Michelle for their uh, kind invitation. And I would like to thank the people uh, in my group at the Donner Center in Nijmegen for their help and all the work that they've done um, allowing me to present this to you. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. Can you please stop sharing the screen? Yes. Thank you so much. A fascinating presentation. Uh, and, I, and I'm not mincing my words. I think that the concept of unmasking the disease is uh, uh, captivating, really. Um, many of us had that perception that stress may have played a part in our disease. In a sense, it may not have played a part in the disease being with us. It may rather have played a part into the disease being unmasked or coming out. And I think the cartoon at the end is so telling with the long queue in front of the prescription medicines uh, pill and no one in front of the other one. And I think that uh, you really uh, have advertised for mindfulness in a way that I had never seen before. I personally was never meditating before I was diagnosed and uh, I'm now meditating 45 minutes a day. And I can basically uh, testify to the fact that it has helped massively with the anxiety in particular. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Uh, this was really putting numbers and science behind concepts that we we know it's good. Now we know it is really, really good <laughs> to meditate for our own sake. Um, so let's just look at the questions. Uh, so yes, a, a question from Bill. He basically is, is Bill is asking, he's saying, if taking an active interest in life and its mm -hmm. many activities, um, many of those activities and, and interests also involve stress. How do you basically recommend balancing the fact that actually we need to go into towards new things and those new things can be stressful? Yeah, so that is a really good question. So, um, so what I'm not saying is that stress is always bad. So stress belongs to life. Uh, and like I showed you with this, this first video, uh, stress is also helpful in dealing with situations in life. Um, that is often acute stress because ultimately stress needs to go away. It needs to um, uh, build up quickly and then go away. If it doesn't, and if it, and that is what we call chronic stress, then it becomes a problem for your health. So um, in, in those situations, I would ask myself where you have chronic stress, if the balance between what you are doing and what you can handle in your life is, is good or whether you need to adjust that. Thank you. An example that comes to mind is Matt Eagles, who is a well-known Parkinsonian Matt is now in his late 40s, early 50s. He may even be online. And he basically got Parkinson's uh, from the age seven, which is quite rare. Mm -hmm. uh, and he basically volunteered to be flown on top of a biplane, uh, basically uh, attached to a plane and doing aerobatics. And I guess that's the right example of like very acute but short-term stress. <laughs> that doesn't become chronic. And, so, and that is also interesting, if, if I can elaborate yes, a little bit on that. So um that is something that i didn't mention but um there is this also this phenomenon that acute stress in some situations can have a beneficial effect on uh on parkinson's disease and people call it kinesia paradoxa for example uh, during the earthquake in italy um, a few years ago when many people died um it was reported that uh, in nursing homes where there were Parkinson patients, 
some of the patients during the acute stress of the earthquake actually ran out of the building. Um, <clears throat> um, so that means, and I've also heard stories from patients, one woman telling me that she was taking care of her grandchild and then suddenly she saw the grandchild at the top of the stairs and she ran to the child to, well, pull it back. And these are also examples when acute stress can, um, well, take away the barriers in the brains of people with right. Parkinson's disease. But that is, again, acute stress. It is not the chronic stress that I... <laughs> Thank you for that. A question from Andrew. Andrew tells us that he often gets brain fog when stressed, and especially when he goes shopping and he forgets his payment card pin, for instance. So it causes his mind to freeze and he can't think straight until he calms down. And he basically is asking if it, this is a, a typical response for people with Parkinson's and how can it be best managed in the moment? Yeah, that's a very interesting observation. I, I hear that more often. Um, so what I think is what, what is going on and, and, and what, what is also the, um, the mechanism behind this unmasking of Parkinson is that um, people with Parkinson's disease, their brains work harder because uh, there are many brain regions that are not so affected by dopamine loss that work harder than in healthy people to compensate. And uh, during a very stressful event, um, uh, which requires your attention to, to do something else, um, this compensatory mechanism doesn't work anymore. Um, and, and that can lead to symptoms. Um, I've heard from other people uh, with Parkinson's disease that sort of, yeah, uh, uh, exercise, uh, uh, um, breathing exercises or relaxation exercises on that moment, so on the spot, can really help to reduce that brain fog. Um, but I guess that takes some exercise, some practice mm -hmm. to, to be able to do that because it's difficult, I can imagine. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> Sue is asking us, she's referring to the unmasking of the disease that happens uh, sometimes under stress. And she basically says, how long would it generally take for the level of stress to unmask PD symptoms? In her case, she had a very serious car accident and her symptoms began about two years later, but she has had always a fairly bad balance and that has turned out to be her primary symptom among many others. Yeah, that's also a very interesting question. So I think nobody really knows the, the exact answer to that. So most people that I um, that tell me about these kind of experiences, um, it is a bit faster than two years. So, uh, for example, the lady that I mentioned, that was one day. Other people are within weeks or months. So two years seems like a, a long period um, for unmasking. Um, but it also depends on what complaints you had after that car accident. If after the car accident, in those two years, you were continuously stressed or, or still recovering or... Um, well, working extra hard, then that might have contributed to the unmasking. Because ultimately the unmasking happens because the compensatory mechanisms in your brain, so the brain regions that work harder to compensate for the, well, beginning of Parkinson's disease, these compensatory mechanisms are sort of shifted away by the stressful events. That's what I think. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Mark is asking us if bradykinesia and or increasing tremor during stressful situations can be potentially a self-preservation mechanism where the body or the brain is trying to prevent you, for instance, from falling or otherwise doing something dangerous or detrimental. Mm. Well, I do think you're right. Uh, Mark, that um, the effects of stress on the motor system, um, not only in people with Parkinson's, but also in healthy people, have a function. Um, and that is that um, 
during these stressful events, the motor system needs to be activated to do something. Um, whether it is a self-prevention mechanism if the symptoms increase so much, I'm not sure about that. So usually in these kind of circumstances, what, yeah, what, what we see is what we call an inverted U-shape. So some level of stress is optimal. It gives the best response, but very little stress is not good. And a lot of stress, too much stress is also not good. Um, so I'm not sure if it's a protective mechanism, but yeah. Thank you. Uh, someone is asking here if someone with a tremor dominant PD, uh, if it could be that that person has enough dopamine, but the dopamine is being converted to adrenaline too fast due to stress, this would be a scenario of fight, flight, and freeze. Well, it is true that people with tremor dominant Parkinson's disease have less dopamine deficits than people with non-tremor Parkinson's disease. Um, and you say dopamine is being converted to adrenaline too fast due to stress, so that during stress you lose the dopamine. Um, I think that is true. I think during stress dopamine is being released and converted again, so taken up again, so you lose a little bit of dopamine um, during stress. Um, whether people fight, flight, or freeze depends also on other, on other factors, not, not only the dopamine, um, but also yeah, a little brain area called the para, uh, periaqueductal gray uh, that determines whether you fight or flight or freeze. Um, yeah. Thank you. The same person is asking, or someone, someone else who appears as um, anonymous, is asking, can you unmask PD if you reduce stress? I think the person means, can you remask PD if you reduce stress? Can you go back? <laughs> Would that be great? Yeah, that is that is one of the great mysteries that we are, <clears throat> that I'm also puzzled with. So, for example, that lady uh, with uh, with where the trembling started after her husband had a heart attack. That tremor never went away, even after her husband recovered and all was fine. They were back at home. The tremor stayed. And the same with the COVID patients that I mentioned who had COVID and after COVID developed Parkinson's disease. When the COVID was over, the Parkinson's didn't go away. So apparently there is something set into motion that cannot be undone. Um, so I have never seen <clears throat> Parkinson's being remasked again. So if anybody has um, uh, experienced that, I would be very interested to hear about it. <laughs> I think most of us would be. Uh, Emma is asking a question, but I think you have already answered. She basically says, while you don't think a one-off stressful event causes PD, could long-term stress cause it? I think the answer is yes. Long-term chronic stress is the, the the stress that causes PD, that, that unmasks PD, not the one of short term. Yeah, and whether it causes PD, I don't think yes. it causes PD. I think it unmasks it, it, unmasks it yeah. Yes. Uh, based on your experience, this is a question from Beverly, quite interesting question. Would a mild sedative or something that basically would be like a, a, a cannabis, uh, uh, medical cannabis or other, other cannabis would be able to help you um, achieve the same kind of effects as maybe you achieve through mindfulness? Yeah, perhaps yes. So um, I think cannabis oil indeed um, can have a relaxing effect. Um, and that might well explain why some people experience that their uh, complaints and their symptoms get better. Um, sedatives. <clears throat> so we have one, we had one study. Uh, um, in, in, in Nijmegen that was just finished where we investigated whether propranolol, which is a beta blocker that um, inhibits um, <clears throat> the uh, adrenaline um, receptors, whether that has an effect on tremor. And actually it does. So tremor becomes less 
if people are with Parkinson's disease are treated with beta blockers. But then medication also has side effects um, uh, like reduced heart rate and mild sedatives <clears throat> can be addictive um, or people can adapt to it. So I think, yes, medication that has an effect on the stress system could lead to improved symptoms in Parkinson's disease, but it can also have side effects. And in some cases, like sedatives, people can adapt to it and get used to it. Question from Paul. Uh, our last speaker was Matthew Phillips, who talked to us about uh, fasting and keto diet. And Paul is talking about here about the fact that uh, both fasting and mindfulness activate or engage the parasympathetic nervous system. And he's asking if you have seen any studies regarding fasting and stress management. Yeah, so that is very interesting. So um, what I think is that there must be some shared mechanisms between these different lifestyle changes. So for example, between the positive effects of exercise and the posit positive effects of certain diets and the positive effects of stress reduction. And one of these mechanisms that people are really interested in, um, including myself, is um, neuroinflammation. So a very mild inflammation in the body um, um, that can respond to all these different aspects. And that is interesting because uh, inflammation has been shown to be reduced by exercise. Uh, inflammation can be reduced by mindfulness and inflammation is increased in people with uh, depression, not only Parkinson uh, patients, but also other people with depression. Um, and I, I don't know, but I can imagine that certain diets also have a positive effect on inflammation. So um, that is actually what we're studying now, if uh, whether stress reduction um, has positive effects by lowering inflammatory levels in people with Parkinson's disease. And if that is true, then we might even think of some medications to help um, achieve these, this lowering of inflammation. Mm, that's a fascinating topic. Um, it brings it all together, really. Uh, question from Lillian, who basically says, when we know that dopamine is degraded to adrenaline uh, due to stress, why do neurologists still advise more dopamine to people? Mm -hmm. I guess she means by that, that less stress would probably require less dopamine. Yeah, I, I understand the question. So indeed, some of the dopamine is uh, is degraded to adrenaline. Not a lot, though, not a lot. And that is one of the possible explanations why some people with Parkinson's disease experience that their tremor can be become a little bit worse after they start with dopaminergic medication. Not all the other symptoms, but particularly tremor. Um, I think the reason why dopamine is uh, still prescribed by neurologists, including me, is that the um, positive effects of, of levodopa um, are much, much, much larger than some of these potentially negative effects, um, like the conversion to adrenaline. Thank you. It's actually more of a comment from Franca than a question. Uh, she's basically saying it's important to mention that one, that one can learn to be mindful not only when meditating, but when doing anything, like walking, doing chores, eating, etc. I think that actually this is an important point um, uh, mentioned there. Thank you, Franca. Uh, Claire is asking if there is a recommended frequency or duration of mindfulness for optimal benefit. I remember the chart you showed us. I don't know if you want to come back to that. Yeah. I think that is really dependent on um, on the circumstances you are in. So um, if you are going through more difficult circumstances, um, it might be better to uh, to do meditation or mindfulness more often. But if you are um, uh, if if life runs easy, then it might not be necessary. So 
usually um, we say that mindfulness is like training a muscle. So you need to do it regularly to keep that ability um, alive to live in the moment. Um, so, yeah. Peter is basically talking about uh, his question is basically is there a possibility that, that stress is caused by that sorry that stress caused by symptoms of Parkinson can increase the propensity for neuroinflammatory effects like sciatica so can the stress of, of Parkinson's create inflammation that indeed then has as an effect sciatica or other similar ailments yeah that's also a good question so um well, I think that having a chronic disorder like Parkinson's disease can contribute to stress. Um, but um, some people have asked, well, or they have commented uh, basically that um, these kind of observations can make them even worry more because when they are stressed, they are um worried about that and and what it might do to the disease and um i don't think that is yeah if you experience that then it might be good to um to seek some help to um to reduce the complaints of stress um, thank you Sarah is asking if people diagnosed with Parkinson's have had more stressful events in general. I don't know if in your study you looked at the people who were diagnosed, did they have more stressful events in their lives than other people? That is also a very interesting question. So I haven't looked into that, but um, that is that would be very interesting. So of course it is difficult um, to study that because you would have to ask people to think back what kind of stressful events they had. And then, well, it might not be comparable the way people with Parkinson's respo uh, respond to that as compared to healthy people. Um, so ideally you would want to follow people for a very long period and register the effects, the, the stressful events that they had, and then see whether people with a lot of stressful events have more risk of Parkinson's disease than people with fewer uh, stressful events. But I don't, um, I'm not aware of any studies into that, but that would be very mm. interesting. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Lisa is asking about neurofeedback. I'm sorry, I don't know what it is. She's basically asking if uh, uh, she has seen neurofeedback reduce PD tremor and other motor symptoms. Have you seen any research that would be supporting it? Yes, that is very interesting too. So neurofeedback is that you use a signal that you can measure from the brain, for example, with EEG or fMRI. And um, that signal is then um, shown to you on a screen and um, you learn to um, adapt to it. And um, I know several studies that are doing research like that in the context of stress. For example, one study in, in, in the institute where I work uh, in healthy people is where they are in the scanner and uh, brain activity is measured. And you see the activity of the stress network on, um, on, on the screen. And you learn to do exercises to lower that activity so that you can directly learn to lower your own uh, stress-related brain activity. And um, similar research um, is being done um, by Professor uh, Talma Hendler in Tel Aviv um, uh, in people with Parkinson's tremor indeed, who also get neurofeedback to learn to more optimally reduce their stress levels by looking at um, their own brain signals. Thank you. Christine is asking if, uh, is functional dyskinesia caused by stress? Um, yeah, so functional dyskinesia. Uh, so if, if, if you mean with that a functional neurological disorder, um, which, used to be called a psychogenic neurological disorder, um, then um, we know from research that about one out of three patients with a functional neurological disorder 
have indeed um, a traumatic experience, a very stressful experience. Two thirds of the people with neurological uh, movement disorders um, uh, or, or functional movement disorders, I should say, did not have a stressful event. So Thank not you. always. Thank you. Stephen, hello, Stephen, uh, is basically saying that he often finds that L-DOPA relieves some of his anxiety, but he's very stressed already. But he, sorry, but if he is very stressed already, then L-DOPA doesn't seem to work. So when he's when he's not stressed, he gets uh, some relief. When he's very stressed, it doesn't really seem to work. He's also referring to the fact that uh, L-DOPA helps with his chronic back pain. I don't know if that makes any sense, question mark. Yeah, yeah that is a very interesting observation that we also saw so we we actually tested that in 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 um in, in our clinic um so people with parkinson's disease um were tested under four circumstances when they were addressed with no medication when they were addressed with medication l-dopa when they were stressed no medication and when they were stressed with medication uh, and what we actually saw is that high levels of stress reduce the effect of L-DOPA. So that is also what you mentioned, that when you are very stressed and you take L-DOPA, it doesn't seem to work. And that is what we also showed. Uh, and that is what a lot of people tell me. And one of the explanations could be that uh, the stress increases the use of L-DOPA or the use of dopamine in the brain. So one would need a little bit more, a higher dose during these stressful events. That's amazing. Uh, Siva is basically explaining his situation. He had a bad car accident uh, in 2017 and his first symptoms were spotted four months later. Uh, it doesn't really have to work, but he's still working. Uh, it's sometimes stressful. He works because it keeps his brain active and he finds that it's good. He does yoga, karate, and gym, and he's asking for your thoughts. I think his question is really about uh, still working full-time in a stressful environment because he's trying to keep his, his brain active and compensating with sport. What do, you, what do you think of that combination? Yes. Yeah, so that, that is really about the balance. So um, I hope I'm not convincing you to stop doing anything and just um, lie, in, uh, lie on the bed and, and avoid stress. So some stress and some um, um, things are, are good to do. So, but it is important to strike the right balance between doing things that you enjoy um, and being stressed about it. Um, which is not unique to Parkinson's. Uh, it is. It applies to 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 anybody actually. Tom picked up in one of your diagrams um, uh, the reference to auditory portion of the brain, and he's asking if there was discussion of positive or negative impact of auditory stimulation. Mm, I don't. I'm not sure which which slide that was, but. Um, um i don't know so um so auditory stimulation you mean like music or or something like that um or drums drums or or drums yeah i mm -hmm. guess it, i guess music is a is a very powerful um um is a very powerful instrument to influence your emotions so in that sense um and and we know also from other work in people with parkinson's disease that music and can can really improve symptoms in people um so in that sense i think that uh, auditory stimulation if you mean music with that um it can certainly have a positive effect yeah thank you rick um Martin basically was uh, finding that driving reduced his uh, tremors because his mind is otherwise occupied. Is there anything to say that science would say behind that the fact that if you think about something else, it may be basically be helpful? Mm. No, it's interesting. So 
um, if you enjoy driving, um, if it puts you at ease, then I can totally understand that. So I've heard stories also from other patients where they say, if I, so one, one lady was doing um, translation work from Dutch to English, and she really enjoyed that. And her husband told me when she's doing that translation work on the computer, she has no tremor. Um, so I do think that if you, well, some people call it flow. If you enter this flow experience that you do something that you like and it, it goes well and you're at ease, but not too calm, not too stressed. And so this flow feeling that symptoms are really reduced in, in Parkinson's disease. So if you enjoy driving, then I understand that. Mm -hmm. And someone was referring about mindfulness in, in daily activity. So if you if you <laughs> if you practice mindfulness without crushing your car, I guess you probably might find it helpful too. Um, Murna is asking about tremors, no tremors when you sleep. So some people still have tremors like they sleep, like I do sometimes, but some people don't find they, they have tremors as they sleep. What does it uh, make you think of? Yeah, it, it depends on the sleep stage. So there are different sleep stages and during the, um, the deep sleep stages and during REM sleep, um, there's no tremor usually in people with Parkinson's. During the um, intermediate stages, there can be tremor. So there have been studies measuring tremor um, and uh, sleep stages with EEG uh, in people who were sleeping uh, and had Parkinson's and uh, certainly tremor goes away during some sleep stages, but can remain during the, the more superficial mm -hmm. sleep stages. We have two more questions. I will just basically probably stop after that. Uh, one question is about the nocebo effect of being diagnosed with PD. Can, can a diagnosis of PD make your symptoms worse because it increases your stress? Yes, I think so. Yeah, I think the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is a very stressful event. and. I think it can certainly make um, symptoms um, transiently worse. And hopefully when you've adjusted or adapted uh, or coped with, with, with the information, um, the symptoms can be a little bit better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the same person is asking if you have seen situations where the symptoms were reversed to the point that they disappeared entirely through uh, stress control, practices. We have seen Tom Isaac basically through meditation achieving at least temporarily that kind of situation. Is that something you have seen more often through your patients? Yes. Yes. Um, especially symptoms like freezing and dyskinesias and tremor are very responsive to um, well acute fluctuations in stress levels. Um, yeah, so that can certainly happen. Thank you, Rick. And then maybe last question for the road from Andrew. He basically uh, is talking about the fact that when people do things they enjoy, uh, is it possible that it's creating more dopamine uh, through the enjoyment factor? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. So the 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 biology of flow is not clear yet. Um, probably it's uh, it's a combination of a few neurotransmitters. So during the flow state, and there are two ingredients. One is that um, you do something that you enjoy. And the other is that you um, are um, slightly excited. So low level of stress combined with something that you enjoy. So this mixture of a little bit of noradrenaline and dopamine probably has a, um, uh, a beneficial effect. So Rick, thank you very much. It has been a really fascinating presentation. I think that actually I will remember in particular that concept of unmasking the disease, which is new to me and might be new to a lot of people who listen tonight and basically is a true revelation for us as to how stress did not really make us have PD, but make it emerge from the depth where it was sleeping, if you want. Uh, and I think as well uh, that uh, you were extremely uh, thoughtful in not only talking about the, the, the stress as a factor of PD, but also what can we do about it. And the mindfulness meditation is absolutely critical. For those of you who would like to take their first steps on the mindfulness path and have never done it before, 
basically, uh, there are quite a few apps uh, available on the market, which is basically an easy way to start with a few minutes every day. And I would just suggest to start really small and build up progressively over time. So, Rick, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time and, and, uh, and, and all your efforts to help us better understand this condition and how to find solutions that will help us in the future. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.